Griffin, it's time to play. I'm ready. Ah! Hello folks and goats of the Command Valley, my name is Griffin, welcoming you to this third episode of Duel of the Peak Season 2. Today I have with me Landon. Hey guys. And we will be your host for today's episode. Before we begin, I would just like to remind you that this episode and this podcast is sponsored by Game Grid Lehigh. If you need to get any of the cards for your decks, feel free to get them over at Game Grid's website, which we will link in the description box below. It helps us out and also helps them out. Another reminder, if you want to support us in the best way possible, head on over to patreon.com slash command valley and consider joining one of our tiers and get access to exclusive benefits, awesome content, and just have a really great time on our Discord. Just to keep you all up to speed, today is episode three of Duel of the Peaks. We have now moved on to Time Spiral, so this will be the first episode featuring cards from Cal Time and Time Spiral remastered in our Commander decks. And all of us have chosen to change Commanders. So we're gonna go ahead and go through the opening hands, the new Commanders, and then we'll begin the play-by-play. -play. To introduce us first, we have Peter, Peter here introducing my deck, Grenzo Dungeon Warden. This Rakdos commander wants to cheat mana costs of creatures by taking low-powered creatures from the bottom of the library and putting them directly onto the battlefield for only two mana. I want to outvalue my opponents with the amount of creatures that I am getting out on the battlefield with powerful effects, and I want to reanimate those creatures for protection when they die to board wipes. My opening hand includes a Draugr Necromancer, Frenzied Raider, Raise the Draugr, Bajuka Bog, a Snow-Covered Mountain, and two Snow-Covered Swamps. Hey guys, Caleb here. My new commander for this game from Time Spiral Remastered is Alesha who smiles at death. She has the ability to bring back my creatures with power two or less from the graveyard, and the main goal of this deck is to get Kiki Jiki and combo off with either Zealous Conscripts or Restoration Angel to create a billion hasty copies of them and win out of nowhere. However, the deck mostly revolves around powerful angels. My opening hand for this game was Great Hall of Starnheim, Snow Covered Swamp, Snow Covered Swamp, Rampage of the Valkyries, Righteous Valkyrie, Replicating Ring, and Village Rites. Back to Griffin. I decided to switch from Vega to Jura of the Gitu. My goal for this deck will be to suspend high mana costed cards and cheat their mana cost by putting them into play after the last time counter is removed. I also have a couple of combos here with Kiki Jiki and Zealous Conscripts. I have the Vesuvian Shapeshifter and Brine Elemental combo. And I also can do some funky stuff with Reiterate. So hoping to get one of those off today. My opening hand was Volatile Fjord, a Mountain, Demon Bolt, Mystic Confluence, Timebender, Aeon Chronicler, and a Chroma Angel of Fury. Hey guys, Landon here, and I have also switched my commander from our first Duel of the Peaks episode. I switched from Fjorda to Tassiger the Golden Claw. The goal of my deck is to break the parity that is in commander spending one spell against one opponent. You're actually at a one for three, which isn't super advantageous. Tasker lets me get spells back from my graveyard as well as filling my graveyard. So I'm going to try controlling the board, having answers to basically everything is, is my game plan, and then hopefully close out the game with some big hitters. My opening hand consisted of a swamp, a blood on the snow, a seal of primordium, an island, a beast whisperer, a far seek, and a forest. With that, Good luck to the players, handing over to Landon for the play-by-play. -play. Thanks Griffin, let's start the game off with Caleb. He draws and plays down a tapped Great Hall of Starnheim and passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin draws and plays down a Volatile Fjord and passes the turn to Peter. Peter draws and plays down a Snow-Covered Swamp and passes the turn to Landon. Landon draws, plays down a Forest and passes the turn back to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws and plays down a snow-covered swamp of his own and passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps, draws, and drops down a mountain as his land for turn and taps both of his lands to foretell a card from his hand. Peter draws and plays down a snow-covered mountain as his land for turn and pays two mana for a Zulaport Cutthroat. With nothing left and being the first person to play a spell, passes the turn to land. Now hold on, I, f I foretold a card. I did something. Yeah. That's not a spell. You didn't cast a spell. You can't yeah, counter foretelling a card. It's not a spell, silly goose. Landon begins his turn. He draws and plays down a swamp and taps two mana for a far seek, tutoring up a woodland chasm onto the battlefield tapped and passes the turn back to Caleb. 
Caleb untaps and draws and drops down a snow-covered swamp and taps three mana for a turn three replicating ring. Here we go. With nothing left, he passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws, and unfortunately missing his land drop, has to pass the turn to Peter. Not a great start, but I'll be back. Peter untaps and draws and plays down a snow-covered swamp as his land for turn, and heads to combat and swings his Zula port cut throw at Landon for one. He takes it, going down to 39. And with nothing left, passes the turn back to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and drops down an island as his land for turn and pays four mana for a Beast Whisperer. With nothing left, he passes the turn back to Caleb. Caleb untaps and in his upkeep puts a counter on his replicating ring. He draws his card for turn and drops down a Terramorphic Expanse. He then pays three mana for a Righteous Valkyrie. And in his end step, Griffin casts a Demonic Bolt to destroy Landon's Beast Whisperer. With no further actions, Griffin begins his turn. The Demonic Bolt targeting Lennon's Beast Whisperer may have been a very early action. However, as we all know in Commander, your card draw is one of the most important parts of your deck, and especially in our limited form in this Duel of the Peak season, removing somebody's card draw is the most important way to backpedal a player. Griffin untaps and draws and passes his turn, having to move to discard and discards a card. Peter begins his turn by untapping and drawing and drops down a snow-covered mountain as his land for turn and pays four mana for a Draugr Necromancer. He heads into combat, swinging his Zulaport Cutthroat at Griffin this time for 1 damage, dropping him down to 39. He then passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and plays down a Swamp and then pays 2 mana to foretell a card from his hand and then pays 2 more mana for a Seal of Primordium. In Landon's end step, Caleb cracks his Terramorphic Expanse to put a Snow-Covered Mountain onto the battlefield. With no further actions, Caleb begins his turn by untapping and puts a counter on his Replicating Ring in his upkeep and draws his card for turn. He then plays down a Snow-Covered Plains as his land for turn and pays 5 mana for a Rampage of the Valkyries. When he ETBs, he gets a 4-4 Flying Angel with Vigilance and that triggers his Righteous Valkyrie, gaining him 4 life, bringing him up to 44. He then heads into combat and swings his Righteous Valkyrie at Peter for 2 damage, bringing Peter down to 38. With nothing left, he passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down a mountain as his land for turn, and then pays 3 mana for his commander, Joyra of the Gitu. Alright folks and goats, here we go. I've paid 3 mana for Joyra. This is the way that I'm going to be able to get around all the expensive mana costs in my hand. So, I, I'm in the game, we're feeling good. And with nothing left to do, Griffin passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and pays 3 mana to cast a replicating ring of his own. He then heads to combat, swinging the Draugr Necromancer at Griffin and the Zulaport Cutthroat at Landon. Neither of them have any blocks, and Griffin drops down to 35 and Landon drops down to 38. He then goes to pass his turn, and in the end step, Landon sacrifices his Seal of Primordium to destroy the Rampage of the Valkyries. Landon then begins his turn by untapping and drawing and drops down a swamp as his land for turn. He then pays 4 mana for a Binding of the Old Gods, which when it enters a battlefield can blow up a non-land permanent, and he decides to point it at Joyra, sending her back to the command zone. That's fair. And with nothing left to do, he passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb untaps and in his upkeep puts a counter on his replicating ring and then draws his card for turn. He then plays down a snow-covered swamp as his land for turn and pays 4 mana for an Eradicator Valkyrie. This will trigger his Righteous Valkyrie, giving him 3 life, pushing him up to 47. This will now give all of his creatures plus 2 plus 2 per the Righteous Valkyrie's static ability. Caleb off to just a rampaging start. It's only turn 5 and he's already got massive pump ability on the board, a lot of creatures, definitely making all the players very nervous. He then heads to combat, swinging the Righteous Valkyrie at Peter and the Angel Token at Landon. Landon responds to this by casting a Foretold Poison the Cup, targeting the Righteous Valkyrie. And in response to that on the stack, Caleb casts a Village Rites, sacrificing his Valkyrie to draw two cards. When it dies, the Draugr Necromancer will exile it with an Ice Counter on it, for Peter to cast later. Damage then goes through, and Landon takes 4 damage, going down to 34. Caleb then, in his second main phase, casts a Beskir Shieldmate, and with nothing left to do, passes the turn back to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and drops down an island as his land for turn and then pays 3 mana for a brutal true name nemesis naming Landon. <laughs> GG, Honestly, right? This card like <laughs> did nothing in my deck. I think it was more just a like a um a meme. This is a meme. A power play. No, it's a meme. It's card... not even a power play. It's just a meme. It's true meme nemesis. True meme nemesis. After that heavy hitting turn, he passes the turn to Peter. <laughs> Alright. 
Peter untaps and in his upkeep puts a counter on his replicating ring and then draws his card for turn. He then drops down a Bajuka Bog, tarting Landon's graveyard and exiling it. Wonder why he did that. And with nothing left to do, passes the turn back to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and in his draw step, the Binding of the Old Gods triggers and the second chapter lets him search his library for a forest and he chooses Rhymewood Falls and it will ETB tapped. He then pays six mana for a Blood on the Snow, destroying all creatures in play. True Name Nemesis, Beskir Shieldmate, and Eradicator Valkyrie are all exiled with ice counters on them per the Draugr Necromancer's ability. Zula Port Cutthroat then triggers and drains each of Peter's opponents for two. I'd like to think that you casted that Blood on the Snow just to get rid of the True Name Nemesis because you were so scared of it. I'm sorry, the True Meme Nemesis. Uh, no, it was that Draugr Necromancer. Y yeah, well, sure. Okay, <laughs> I needed to get rid of it. I was hosing <laughs> my deck. I had to look at every single card in my graveyard as ramp to get my commander out, so casting a Blood on the Snow and getting into my graveyard is one more mana that I can get put into my commander. And with nothing left to do, Landon passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb untaps and in his upkeep puts another counter on his replicating ring, bringing it up to four, and draws his card for turn. He then pays seven mana for a Tybalt Cosmic Imposter. He then activates Tybalt's plus two ability and exiles Laboratory Maniac, Wheel of Fate, and Coalition Relic from the tops of his opponent's libraries. Now that wasn't too heavy of a hit from Tybalt, but it's definitely scary to all of the players. Stealing cards from them, essentially allowing Caleb to draw three cards every turn. Very scary, and quickly the table is trying to figure out how to get rid of the Tybalt. And with nothing left to do, Caleb passes his turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down an island as his land for turn, and he strikes a deal with Peter, making sure the two of them can deal with the Tybalt. He then pays five mana for a gold span dragon and heads into combat. He swings his dragon at Tybalt for a total of 4 damage in the air, and on the attack he gets a treasure from the dragon's ability, and this will knock Tybalt down to 3 loyalty. He then goes to pass his turn, and in the end step, Peter casts an instant speed, raise the Draugr, getting Zulaport Cutthroat back from his graveyard and into his hand. With no further game actions, Peter begins his turn by untapping, and in his upkeep he puts another counter on his replicating ring, and draws his card for turn. He then pays 2 mana to cast the Zulaport Cutthroat that he recently returned to his hand, and then pays four mana for Carter's Vicious Return. The first chapter lets him sacrifice Zulaport Cutthroat to deal the final three damage to Tybalt, taking it out. The Zulaport Cutthroat then triggers when it dies, draining everybody at the table for one and gaining Peter a life. I've got to hand it to Peter here. When I made the deal with him, I didn't realize that he would need to use three cards to do that last three damage. I just casted a dragon that I needed to attack with anyway. So props to Peter for jumping through all those hoops just to get rid of Tybalt. And with nothing left to do and feeling very satisfied with the Tybalt being off the table, he passes the turn back to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and the Binding of the Old Gods, the third lore chapter triggers, giving all of his non-existent creatures death touch until the end of the turn. Also, I think I'm the only person um, up until this point that has not cast a replicating rank at any point in time in all four episodes that we've recorded. It sounds like you just need to get good. I've put them in. I think I've put it. Oh, no, I didn't even put it in my deck. That makes sense. <laughs> oh my gosh, Landon. With the Saga off the table, Landon then pays three mana for a Courser of Crufix. He can now play with the top card of his library revealed, and he can play lands from the top of his library. He then pays four mana, delving some cards away from his graveyard to cast his commander, Tassiker, and with nothing left, passes the turn back to Caleb. Caleb untaps and in his upkeep puts a fifth counter on his replicating ring and then draws his card for turn. He then pays three mana to cast the Coalition Relic from Exile and pays three mana to cast his commander Alesha who smiles at death. And with nothing left to do, passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and heads to combat, swinging his Goldspan Dragon at Caleb for four in the air and on attack he gets to make a treasure. Caleb takes it going down to 40. He then pays five mana to replay his commander Joyra of the Gitu. And with nothing left, passes the turn to Peter. Peter untaps and in his upkeep, his replicating ring will get its third counter. He draws his card for turn and Carter's vicious return will hit its second lore chapter, making everybody discard a card. He then drops down a snow-covered mountain as his land for turn and pays four mana for the hefty artifact Hedron Archive. You take all the ramp that you can get. And with nothing left to do, he passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and taps six mana to cast a Harvester of Souls. Caleb responds to that on the stack by tapping his Coalition Relic to put a charge counter on it. With no further actions, Landon passes the turn back to Caleb. 
Caleb untaps and in his upkeep, his replicating ring will get its sixth counter and he draws his card for turn. Coalition Relic then triggers and he removes the charge counter from it, adding a red to his mana pool. Using eight mana, he casts a Chroma Angel of Fury. Uh, a Chroma in this meta is actually pretty difficult considering that Landon and I are both playing blue. Can't be countered protection from blue and white. A lot of us in our removal is in blue and white, especially for Griffin at this point in time. Um, all my removal was in blue. That was a harsh hit. Caleb then heads into combat and swings Alesha at Peter for a total of 3 damage, and Peter takes it, going down to 37. At this point, Landon makes a deal with Griffin to help him get the Crossing Grit back into his hand so he can deal with that replicating ring of Caleb's, as it is getting really close to replicating. Caleb then moves to his end step and in that end step, Griffin suspends an Aeon Chronicle and a Mole Drifter using Joyra's activated ability. With no further game actions, Griffin begins his turn and in his upkeep removes the suspend counters from his suspended permanence. This will trigger the Aeon Chronicler and Griffin will draw a card. He then draws his card for turn and heads into combat. He swings the Goldspan Dragon at Landon, which on attack will make a treasure. Landon has no blocks and goes down to 27. With nothing left to do, Griffin passes the turn to Peter. I love just passing with all my mana open. Peter untaps and in his upkeep puts another counter on his replicating ring and draws his card for turn. Carter's vicious return then triggers its third and final lore chapter, returning Draugr Necromancer back to the battlefield. He then plays down a Draugr Recruiter and passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and pays 5 mana for a Grey Merchant of Asphodel. When this ETBs, that's going to drain each of his opponents for 5 and Landon will gain 15 life, bringing him back up to 42. With nothing left to do, he passes the turn back to Caleb. So at this point in the game, I was kind of in a, a pickle, a, a tricky situation in other words, mostly because of that Draugr Necromancer. Equally because of that Draugr Necromancer and the Acroma, I was kind of running light on removal. Um, I didn't have a ton of mana. I wasn't, I really didn't have enough mana to feasibly activate Tassiger and, you know, cast a spell that Tassiger returned to me. And I was really split between wanting to get rid of a Chroma because that represented death in the air and the Necromancer representing exiling my graveyard. Uh, and that was really impeding my Grey Merchant uh, engine of casting Grey Merchant, you know, draining everybody at the table, maybe using it as a blocker, sending it to the yard, getting it back, casting it again. So I was really caught in a rock in a hard place at this point in the game. Kayla begins his turn by untapping and in his upkeep puts the seventh counter on his replicating ring and draws his card for turn. Caleb heads into combat, swinging a Chroma at Landon and Alesha at Griffin, and using Alesha's triggered ability, he pays two mana to return Valky from the graveyard to the battlefield. With Valky's trigger on the stack, Griffin pays two mana to suspend an Acroma of his own, and then Valky's ETB resolves, exiling Felden of the Third Path from Peter's hand, Jaya Ballard Taskmage from Griffin's hand, and nothing from Landon's hand. Combat then resolves, and no blocks are declared. Landon takes six, and Griffin takes five. This takes Landon down to 36, and Griffin is now sitting at 22. In his second main phase, Caleb then taps two mana for a stalwart Valkyrie, exiling a card from his graveyard to have a reduced cost for the Valkyrie. He then taps four mana to cast a Solemn Simulacrum, which on ETB will let Caleb search for a snow-covered mountain and put it into play tapped. He then goes to pass his turn, and in the end step, Griffin pays five mana to cast a Graven Lore, scrying one and drawing three cards. Griffin then begins his turn by untapping and in his upkeep removes the time counters from his suspended cards and drawing a card off of the Aeon Chronicler's ability. He then draws his card for turn and plays down an island as his land for turn. He then pays 3 mana for a replicating ring of his own and heads to combat swinging the Goldspan Dragon at Caleb for 4 in the air and making a treasure when it attacks. Caleb has no blocks and drops down to 31. Griffin then passes his turn to Peter. Peter untaps, and in his upkeep, his replicating ring will get its fifth counter, and then he draws his card for turn. He then pays seven mana to cast his commander, Grenzo, and it will enter with five plus one plus one counters on it, making it a 7-7. Seven, seven. With nothing left to do, Peter passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws, and activates his commander's activated ability to mill two, and giving the choice to Griffin, gets the Reclamation Sage from his graveyard into his hand. He then plays the Reclamation Sage, destroying Caleb's replicating ring. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I'll be doing this all game, and all next game. Right on time. <laughs> uh, I am just the policeman at the table, and I'm not a very good one. <laughs> well, you have two others to worry about now. Yeah, I know. And with nothing left to do, Landon passes the turn back to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws, 
and pays seven mana for an Akroma's Memorial. At this point, there is some discussion around the table. Griffin is revealed in his hand. He has a Mystic Confluence, which could be used to counter the Akroma's Memorial. However, Griffin also wants to draw cards from it, so he decides to let it resolve. Caleb then heads to combat and swings everything at Landon, who is unable to block and takes a total of 17 damage, dropping down to 19. After combat, Caleb has no further actions and passes the turn. Griffin casts a Mystic Confluence in the end step, returning Landon's Reclamation Stage to his hand and drawing two cards. So this is the way that we were able to resolve this debacle by using the Mystic Confluence to help Griffin to draw cards but also bounce the Reclamation Stage, gave the ability for Landon to be able to deal with the Akroma's Memorial rather than spend my resources to do so. Griffin begins his turn by untapping and in his upkeep removes time counters from his suspended permanents, drawing a card off of the Aeon Chronicler and putting a counter on his replicating ring. He then draws his card for turn and plays down an island as his land for turn and pays two mana for a Joyrest time bug. He then pays four mana for a Solemn Simulacrum and heads into combat swinging his Goldspan Dragon at four in the air, gaining another treasure. Peter has no blocks and he will go down to 28. He then goes to pass his turn, and in the end step, Peter activates Grenzo, getting an Arnie Broken Brow onto the battlefield from the bottom of his library. Peter begins his turn by untapping, and in his upkeep, Replicating Ring will get its sixth counter. He draws a card for turn, and pays two mana for Magda, Brazen Outlaw. And with nothing left to do, Peter passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws, and gets a forest from the top of his library with Corsure of Krufix's ability, and puts it into play and gains a life. He then activates Tassiger and mills two, and Griffin gives him back Treasure Cruise. He then pays three mana for a Reclamation Sage, which when ETBs will blow up the Akroma's Memorial. He then passes, but in his end step, Caleb activates the Coalition Relic to put a charge counter on it. Caleb then begins his turn by untapping and drawing, and plays down a Snow-Covered Plains as his land for turn. He then heads into combat, swinging a Chroma and Stalwart Valkyrie, both at Landon in the air, and with no blockers, Landon takes 12, dropping down to 8. He then pays 3 snow mana to cast a Search for Glory, searching his library for a Kiki-Jiki and putting it into his hand. He then gets to gain 3 life from using 3 snow mana to cast the Search for Glory. And with nothing left to do, he passes the turn to Griffin. This is a very loud red flag warning. We all know that Kiki-Jiki is part of a two-card combo, and we know that Caleb is playing that combo, so for him to tutor up a piece of his combo tells the tells the board that he may have the combo in his hand. So at this point, all eyes are on Caleb. Griffin untaps and in his upkeep puts a second counter on his replicating ring and removes the time counters from Aeon Chronicler and Moldrifter and are now cast for free. The Moldrifter will ETB, drawing him two cards, and Aeon Chronicler will draw Griffin a card from removing the time counter from it, and then he draws his card for turn. He then pays 5 mana for a Magus of the Future. He then heads to combat, swinging Mole Drifter and Goldspan Dragon, both at Caleb for 6, and he will make a treasure. Caleb has no blockers and takes it, going down to 28. He then goes to pass, but in his end step, Peter activates Grenzo 4 times and unfortunately mills no creatures. Peter untaps and in his upkeep puts the 7 counter on his replicating ring and then draws his card for turn. He pays 3 mana for a Stinkweed Imp and goes to pass his turn, and in his end step, Landon responds by sacrificing a swamp and cycling his Edge of Autumn to draw a card. Griffin also responds by casting a Pongify from the top of his library, destroying the Draugr Necromancer, and Peter will get to make a 3-3 Ape. You're welcome. Landon begins his turn by untapping and drawing, and delves away 5 cards from his graveyard and taps 2 mana to cast a Treasure Cruise, drawing 3 cards. Christian responds with this by buybacking a Reiterate, copying Treasure Cruise, and drawing three cards himself, and putting the Reiterate back into his hand. Mmm. Yes. And with nothing left to do, Landon passes his turn, and in his end step, Caleb taps a Coalition Relic to put a charge counter on it. Caleb then begins his turn by untapping and drawing, and puts his one red mana from the Coalition Relic into Akroma's Fire Breathing ability, pumping it plus one plus O oh until the end of turn. Landon, at this point, seeing that his life is hanging in the hands of Caleb, threatens Caleb that if he swings, he's going to bounce Caleb's blockers back to his hand with the Mystic Confluence, leaving him very open for a crackback from Griffin. Caleb, not falling for Landon's bluff, heads to combat, swinging Akroma at Landon. In response, Landon does cast the Mystic Confluence, but instead of king making and bouncing his things, Landon draws three cards. Seeing that Landon got nothing from the card draw, Caleb then pumps two more mana into a Chroma, pumping it enough to take Landon out of the game. Rip in peace, Landon. 
Rip in peace. I died. I feel like that was that was really tough. Your board, even though it may not have seemed scary, I feel like the threat that was being assessed was your ability to replay your stuff over and over again. And with that Gary on the battlefield, I felt like most of us really just wanted that gone. And by default, Caleb decided to get rid of you. Well, also, I think Caleb did to me what I did to you at the beginning of the game. Like, I was continuously, continually blowing up his stuff. So he killed me for it. I, I, I think it was mostly just revenge, which is fair. Oh, I don't think of revenge very much. I just play true meme nemesis is naming you. Yeah. <laughs> Caleb then pays four mana for Fyoda's retribution, making a 4-4 angel with flying and vigilance. He then goes to pass his turn, and in Caleb's end step, Griffin taps Joyer's time bug to remove the last counter from his acroma, and he gets to put her into play. Griffin begins his turn by untapping and in his upkeep puts a third counter on his replicating ring and he draws his card for turn. He drops down a mountain as his land for turn and pays four mana to cast a 4C, scrying four cards to the bottom and drawing two. He then heads into combat, swinging his goldspan dragon at Peter for four and will get to make a treasure token. Peter blocks with the stinkweed imp and both of them will die due to the stinkweed imp having death touch. With the Brine Elemental sitting on top of his library, being able to see it with the Magus of the Future, he decides to pay 3 to morph it onto the battlefield. He then pays the rest of his mana to hardcast Alren's Epiphany, giving him two bird tokens and taking an extra turn after this one. He then passes and goes to discard, and then begins his second turn. He untaps, and in his upkeep puts a counter on his replicating ring, and then draws his card for turn. He then plays down an island from the top of his library with the Magus, and then flips the Brian Elemental face up so Peter and Caleb will both skip their next untap steps. At this point, everybody is aware that Griffin has the Vesuvian Shapeshifter in his hand, which is the other part of this loop, which locks his opponents out from having an, any untap steps. It's not really a hard lock, it's kind of a soft lock. There are ways out of it. Your opponents can still play lands, they can still cast spells. It's not really staxy in the way that it makes it harder to cast spells. They just can't really attack. They don't have an untap step. So it's not an impossible lock, but it's pretty problematic. Griffin then heads into combat, swinging a Chroma and Mole Drifter and two birds at Peter and Aeon Chronicler at Caleb. Peter has no blocks and Caleb blocks the Chronicler with the Solemn Simulacrum, letting him draw a card when it dies and Peter goes down to 18. Peter begins his turn by skipping his untap step and in his upkeep puts the 8th counter on his replicating rings and the rings replicate. And instead of drawing, he is going to dredge 5 with the Stinkweed Imp's ability, returning it to his hand. Eh, <laughs> damnation. He then pays 3 mana to cast the Stinky Boy that is the Stinkweed Imp. He then heads into combat and swings Grenzo and Arnie at Griffin. And Griffin blocks with Joy's Timebug and Solemn Simulacrum, both of which will die. Solemn Simulacrum on death will draw Griffin a card, and with nothing left to do, Peter passes the turn to Caleb. Caleb skips his untap step, draws, and plays down eight planes, and Fiora's Retribution will now go to its second lore chapter, giving all of Caleb's angels the ability to tap and to destroy a permanent. He then pays three mana to activate Valky's ability to turn it into a Jaya Ballard, and using Jaya Ballard's ability, discards a swamp, paying a mana, and destroys the Brine Elemental. That was very clutch. Yeah. They were very quickly going to be... Not necessarily completely locked out, but very heavily locked out. For, so for Caleb to get rid of that Brine Elemental, that was very important to this game. He then taps his stalwart Valkyrie to destroy Drora, sending her back to the command zone. He then in heads into combat, swinging his Angel token at Griffin for 4 damage. Griffin takes it, going down to 18. He then taps his Angel to blow up the Magus of the future. He then passes his turn back to Griffin. Griffin untaps, and in his upkeep will put the 5th counter on his Replicating Ring, and draws his card for turn. He then drops down a mountain and taps two mana for Baral, Chief of Compliance. He then casts the Vesuvian Shapeshifter and it will enter the battlefield as a copy of Mole Drifter, drawing him two cards when it does so. He then heads to combat, swinging a Chroma and two birds at Caleb in the air, bringing Caleb down to 18. He then pays five mana to cast Walk the Aeons to take an extra turn after this one, sacrificing three islands to buy it back. He then passes and goes to his first extra turn. He untaps and in his upkeep puts the 6th counter on the replicating ring and draws his card for turn. He then plays on an island as his land for turn and pays 5 more mana to cast the walk the Aeons again and holds priority and taps 5 mana for a reiterate to cast and buy it back copying walk the Aeons. He also pays walk the Aeons 
buy that cost, sacrificing three lands to put it back into his hand. So he is going to take two extra turns as a result of this. He then heads to combat, swinging a Chroma, Mole Drifter, and two birds in the air at Caleb for 10 more damage. Caleb takes it going down to eight. He then passes and moves to his third extra turn, having one more after this, untaps, and in his upkeep, puts another counter on his replicating ring, draws his card for turn, and drops down a mountain. He heads to combat, swinging a Chroma, Mole Drifter, and two birds at Caleb, finishing Caleb off. Rip in peace, Caleb. Rip in peace, Caleb. From the start of the game, Caleb was definitely the biggest threat, just playing threat after threat, bomb after bomb, and it seemed like it was really hard to catch up, but with Caleb putting all of his efforts into taking out Landon, he kind of left himself open uh, for, for a lot of damage coming his way. So, well played, Caleb. You definitely deserved the most victorious defeat that you could. With Caleb being dead, Griffin passes the turn to none other than Griffin, moving to his fourth <laughs> turn. He untaps, and in his upkeep, Replicating Ring will get its eighth counter, and it will replicate. He then draws and heads to combat, swinging all of his attackers in the air at Peter. And in response to this, Peter pays three mana to cast a sudden spoiling, turning all of Griffin's creatures into zero twos without any abilities. Or since the sudden spoiling has split second, all the counter spells in my hand didn't do a thing, so I just had to suck it up at this point and take what was coming for me. With Griffin's creatures essentially neutered, he then blocks four creatures with his four untapped creatures, wiping out Griffin's creatures. Griffin then pays five more mana for a Walk the Aeons and holds priority and pays five mana to cash reiterate and buy it back, copying the Walk the Aeons. Still holding priority, he pays five more mana to cast the reiterate, buying it back again. Walk the Aeons then resolves and he buys it back, sacrificing his last three islands, so Griffin will be taking an extra three turns after this one. He passes and goes to his fifth extra turn. He untaps and in his upkeep will put another counter on his replicating ring and additionally he flips his Vesuvian shapeshifter face down. He then draws his card for turn and casts a battle of frost and fire dealing 4 damage to each non-giant creature. Holding priority, he pays 2 mana to flip the Vesuvian shapeshifter face up copying his Aeon Chronicler. All but Peter's Grenzo and Griffin's Aeon Chroniclers will go to the graveyard, dying from the damage. He then heads to combat and swings everything he can at Peter for a total of 14 damage. Peter responds by tapping his 8 replicated rings to mill the bottom 4 cards of his library, desperately looking for a creature. However, he manages to find 3 lands and a psychotic episode so he ends up having to take the damage, going down to 6. Griffin then passes and goes to his 6th extra turn. He untaps and in his upkeep puts a counter on his replicating ring, draws his land for turn, and the Battle of Frost and Fire will trigger its second lore counter. He scries three and keeps all three on top. He then heads quickly into combat, swinging his Aeon Chroniclers at Peter, taking Peter out of the game. Rip, Rip in, peace. in peace, Peter. That was really sad to see that Grenzo couldn't pull some creatures out of the bottom of his library, uh, but so it is. The fate had been sealed it's ever since... I took six extra turns. Yeah, that, that happens, you know. As it does. The, Walk the Aeons is just a nuts card. And you're getting time warp. Of course I'm getting time warp. <laughs> I, I'm not going to do that again, though. I'm not going to try to d loop my turns again. Felt like that was good for that was good for one episode. Not going to do it again. Handing off a big congratulations uh, to myself, I suppose. Let's move over to the post-game thoughts. Uh, Lennon, will you go ahead and share your thoughts about the game? Yeah, absolutely. This was an incredibly fun game. Uh, I feel like everybody's decks had a really good showing. Caleb's deck was able to put out a bunch of really threatening flyers. Peter's deck showed how quickly it could pull things from the bottom of his library into play. Unfortunately, he whiffed a couple of times, but I think his commander has a lot of potential. Obviously, Griffin's deck had some absolute haymakers with Reiterate, Walk the Aeons, that Aeon Chronicler. I mean, his deck was playing some super powerful spells. My deck I was a little disappointed with, but I was satisfied with how well I was able to kind of police the table. I feel like a lot of the things that I did really set the, the table up for, well, I feel like I went really far out of my way to help the table out at Caleb's expense, really removing his Akroma's Remorial and his, and his Replicating Rings, but I felt like my deck was pretty controlling, so yeah. Overall, I think my biggest thoughts about this game, since we started doing this Duel of the Peak Season 2, starting off with Call Time and now adding Time Spiral Remastered to it, 
it really felt like we had legit commander decks. Even just with two sets being added into the mix, we all had very different and unique decks with different strategies. Even though we were playing a lot of the same cards, we had a lot of different interactions and powerful turns that were focused around our strategy. So I'm really happy with the way that went. It probably might seem hoity-toity of me to say, but I think that loop with Reiterate and Walk the Aeons was also pretty cool to do in a limited format. Uh, don't think I'm going to be planning to do that again. Everybody's going to see it coming, uh, but I think I'll take the win for today. Now moving on to Peter and Caleb for their post-game thoughts. Peter here with some post thoughts about this game. Looking back, it really felt like I never had a really good grasp on the board and there were always bigger threats at the table that I couldn't get past. And so ha not having enough interaction to really deal with the other things and r really in a position where I would suffer from a board wipe was putting me in a bad position. And I also got extremely unlucky with my Grenzo pulls. I only got one creature out of the nine times I activated Grenzo during that game. So that was a pretty big feel bad. I don't know. I feel like I played the deck to the best of my ability, but next time I feel like I'm going to really try to revamp the deck. I had two different ideas for what I wanted to make this deck, and the next one is going to be even better. So I am looking forward to playing that in the next episode completely revamped and taking more advantage of Grenzo than this one. Hey guys, Caleb again. This was such an exciting game. I felt kind of bad for focusing so much on killing Landon, but then I remembered that he killed a lot of my stuff, so he kind of asked for it. Akroma and the rest of my angels definitely did their jobs well, but they were tough to keep around and I was super happy to get Tybalt two games in a row, but was again not surprised to see him die right after playing him, even though it was perfectly timed after that board wipe. Getting Valky back and turning him into Jaya to stop Griffin from permanently locking us out of our untapped steps was probably my favorite play of the game. I just really wish that I could have gotten another piece of my combo since I held on to Kiki Jiki for so much of that game but Griffin taking a million extra turns was also pretty cool. This was a super fun game. Thanks for watching. All right, now moving on to the play of the game and the card of the game. Lennon, share with us your thoughts. What do you think was the play of the game? I I think the play of the game, I think the obvious choice was probably your extra turns. That was uh, pretty critical. Also, I'm inclined to also think that me blowing up Caleb's Akroma's Memorial was a huge part of the game. Uh, and I think why that is, is you look at the context of the decks that we were playing, and I was the only one that feasibly could permanently deal with artifacts. Uh, what What do you think? I honestly, I'm going to agree with you. Th uh, I'm going to agree with you here. I think the play of the game, or at least the one that made the most difference. I know as far as like most powerful plays, probably the extra turns is going to take the cake for that one. But the most crucial part, I think, definitely was getting rid of that Chromos Memorial. The only reason that I was able to go in at Caleb is because he didn't have enough flyers to block me. But if he had the Chromos Memorial out and had Vigilance and Flying, then I wouldn't have been able to close out the game as fast with Caleb. So I think that made a... Yeah, and if, if that would have stuck around and all of his creatures had protection from red and his Chroma had protection from blue, then I essentially was very hard locked out of trying to deal with what Caleb had going on. That removal of a Chroma's Memorial, I think, helped me slither in, into, into that win. So thank you, Landon. You're welcome. All right, now let's talk about the MVP card of the game. Landon, what did you think was the MVP card of this third episode of Duel of the Peaks? Gosh, there are so many contenders. Uh, honestly, I think Walk the Aeons or uh, <laughs> Reiterate. I'm, I think those two just did so much work. Pro I'm probably going to go through Reiterate because that did more outside of just like the combo win at the turn like you're able to reiterate the spells that i was casting for value so that's pretty cool yeah i think i think so because the walk the aeons i would have only been able to take maybe one or two extra turns by buying it back because i only had a certain amount of islands and if i wasn't able to copy it with reiterate then my replicating ring wouldn't have went off which allowed me to get more mana to to use with the reiterate so i'm going to say reiterate bar walk the aeons as card of the game yeah, I agree. All right, now that we've finished talking about the play of the game and the card of the game, let us know in the comments what you guys thought was the play of the game and what you guys thought were the card of the game. 
And uh, how salty would you be if somebody took six extra turns in your commander game? I, w I want to hear it. I can certainly say that the table was a little bit salty with that many extra turns. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I was dead, so... <laughs> Lennon was just supporting me from 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 the scene behind the scenes. So let's uh, take a couple of minutes here and tally up the total wins for the season thus far. We've got Griffin at two and Peter at one. And just to give you a little hint into what we're playing on the next episode of Duel of the Peaks, we're still keeping the same commanders, but we are allowed to switch up the rest of the deck if we so choose. Some of us are definitely going to keep the deck the same some of us are going to change out a bunch of the cards after seeing the threats at the table and what everybody else is playing so stay tuned for that to see what we change and what we keep the same in the next episode all right friends thank you so much for watching we're really glad you're here and a quick reminder if you're not already subscribed to the channel then please subscribe to the channel check out all of our other content including our deck techs other gameplays season one of duel of the peaks which is on youtube for you we will link it in the video you can find it somewhere on the screen and as a quick reminder, this episode and this podcast is sponsored by GameGrid. If you need any of your cards, feel free to check out their website, and we will include that in the link in the description box below. Helps us out, but the way that you can help us out the most is by going to our Patreon at going to patreon.com slash commandvalley and checking out our tiers and consider joining today. Thank you so much, my friends and my fellow goats, and we will see you for the next episode. See ya. All around me are familiar faces. Worn out places, worn out faces. Except for there are no faces because there are no creatures. There are no creatures. <laughs> <laughs> for the meme. For the meme.